Thank you, everyone. It's a packed house. Uh, welcome. I hope you're having a great day so far, and, and welcome to SAM. Um, uh, as mentioned, I'm the program director at Epic of Christ. We're on the south side of Chicago. Am I echoing? Is this okay? Is this all right? Okay. So what we're going to do in the next 40 minutes is we're going to give you some tools to transform your conference at your program. And my goals here are these. We're going to apply some conference best practices, and we're actually going to talk about where these come from and get a little help from you all. We're going to talk a little bit about some specific educational resources. I want you to leave here today with the toolbox so that you can actually um, bring these ideas to your conference and help make it you know, bigger and better. We'll integrate creativity and innovation into our didactics back home. And finally, if we have a little time, and I'm suspecting we may not, but we'll maybe get to how we might implement some of these teaching skills outside of the didactic environment and actually into the you know, clinical arena, how you can be you know, optimal teachers of medical students and whatnot when you're in the ED. So disclosures, I have no conflict of interest. I have one disclosure and that is I am by no means a conference guru. I was asked to do this and I embrace it because I love conference. I think it's a wonderful way to learn. Um, but I also know that I don't have all the answers. So I reached out to our members of our community of practice in academic emergency medicine. I belong to CORD, I belong to SAM. And I sent a message out to the CORD listserv and said, you know, what are you all doing for your conference? What do you love about your conference? What doesn't work? And I got a lot of responses back. And so that's what I've really done to incorporate into this talk today. And hopefully we'll sort of bring all those ideas together and again, let you have something to take home at the end of it. Um, I went to Court Academic Assembly last month and there were a bunch of didactics about this topic. I also have been here all week and there's been some wonderful talks about, you know, basically changing your conference, giving a good presentation, slide design. I'll mention a few of those at the end. And even if you aren't able to go to those conferences, you might check out the websites for both CORD and for SAM, because again, there's a lot of handouts, materials available that you could use and incorporate into, you know, making your conference bigger and better. And then I looked out at the audience and I was like, wow, here we have like over 200 of you all here. You're on the front lines. You're at conference, you know, every week. And I thought maybe we could do a couple minutes of crowdsourcing and get a few ideas from you all about two questions. The two questions are, what really works at your conference every week? What are the things that make your residents energized and excited about conference? And on the flip side, what are the big fails? What are the things that people try to do at conference that causes all the residents to roll their eyes and you know, sneak out the back end and you know, sort of basically skip out a conference? And in front of you on at least most of the tables, there are some four by six cards. We're gonna take a very short three minutes. What I'd like you to do is think, talk amongst yourselves at your tables maybe, Think about things that are really awesome at your conference, things that you would like to never see again at your conference, and maybe just write a few of those things down. Because then we'll take a couple of minutes for feedback from the audience verbally, but I'll also collect all these cards at the end, and I'm gonna put together, well, I have put together a huge handout with all of the details that we're talking about today, and I'm gonna incorporate your feedback into that handout as well. So you don't have to write anything else down after this for the rest of the talk. You can just listen and it'll all be on the handout that'll be available to you online. So three minutes, everybody talk amongst yourselves, go. Do we have any, um, do we have any uh, microphones that are uh, like freestanding that someone could, so if they raise their, yeah, take it to me off. Yeah. All right, we're all in emergency medicine, so that should be all the time we need to think about a question like this, right? So, 
Coming back together, uh, again, if you um, have written stuff down on cards, leave them on the table and we'll collect those all. What I could use from you all now is ideas. So anyone want to raise a hand? We have medical student volunteers in blue jackets with microphones. Hello. <laughs> so anyone have great ideas to share with the audience, with the crowd, about things that work in your place that are super awesome at your conference every week? Go. Any volunteers? Stage right. Hey, everybody. Left. I'm Steve from Indiana University. Um, so see. we have something called tabletop disaster days where for two hours they'll just drop like a stack of about 20 patients on your desk with your group. And you have like a virtual ER that you put those patients in. You say who needs to go to the shock rooms, who needs what uh, resources. And then they'll just come and drop another 20 patients on you. And essentially it simulates a big mass casualty um, kind of scenario. You, you have to figure out who you're going to transfer. You have to figure out kind of, you, you have to go outside the box to figure out what you can do. Sometimes you'll put five different people on an ambulance and send them elsewhere. And so just causes a lot of creativity and you see what your colleagues do that you would never think about, um, and, and it's very interactive. That's awesome. So I'm hearing interactive, interesting approach to a problem, and uh, very creative. Really great. Other ideas, other things that, that people really love about their conference? Approaches that work in the back. Um, like three 15-minute lectures, quick. It makes the faculty kind of pick what's the most important concepts of those and also kind of allows us to pay more attention than an hour-long diatribe. Great. So brevity, right? Paying attention to adult learners and what they need, which is shorter attention span. You want high impact. You know, really lectures should, should this whole idea of hour-long lectures or beyond is, is, is really, you know, old school. So we need to get away from that. Great. Other ideas? So we introduced something in our conference where it's like a 15 minute or half hour uh, lecture called Week or Month in Review, where there are real cases that came into our OR in the last uh, month or so um, and pick out like pearls from the cases that we actually had like our hands on in. So the residents, because then you have some like, um, you're recognizing resident accomplishments and stuff like that too. So it makes the people more like apt to listen. Great. So ownership, accountability, skin in the game, and especially that, that sense of these are really things that happen to us, this matters to us. How about on the flip side? Anything that you want to share that you wish would never, ever happen in your conference again? Okay, so food is really awesome, yes. So um, if you're at a place where you don't have food, that can be a problem. Uh, any ideas on how you work around that? Well, we went, yeah, so we went through that at our shop, right? They basically slashed our budget to zero for anything related to food because we don't need to eat, right? And we don't need social time and interaction. So there is something about, you know, trying to get your residents involved in that as far as the spirit of it all, sharing that responsibility. Our residents would basically bring in things in the morning or would basically, you know, pitch in for lunch together. And, you know, pizza doesn't have to be expensive. And so that's something that you can work around as a program. And if it's not every week, maybe it's every couple or two or three weeks. So that is definitely something. All right, interest of time, and again, if you've written other stuff down and you didn't want to necessarily share out loud, we'll collect the cards, but let's see uh, if this matches a little bit my take-homes that I learned when I put this question out to uh, our learning community, and I think you'll see a lot of the same themes here. So these are my four big take-homes for you. If you want to transform your conference, first of all, use your conference as a discussion generator, not an information disseminator, and really what that means is flip your classroom, right? So anything that's going to be learner responsible content, send it out ahead of time. If that's going to be an article, a foam, you know, foam med podcast, if it's going to be you know, something that they need to look at and learn from that's static and they can do on their own, have them do it beforehand and use your conference as this time for rich discussion about that topic. Right? So that's a, that's a core concept for a successful conference. The second one is whenever you can be thinking, can I make this small group interactive and case-based? And that's what we're hearing about when people are talking from the audience. 
Thirdly, it's really fun once in a while to just blow it up and get very creative. And we're going to give you a couple of ideas along that way. You know, planning a conference and conference design can be a little bit drudgery. And so if you can actually enjoy it and have a lot of fun with it once in a while, that's, a, that's just something for you. So, so think about that. How can you make conference fun and, cre and creative for your residents? And then the fourth and very important thing is you may think coming into this, and our chiefs do this every single year, you know, they all have great intentions, they're going to transform conference, it's going to be so different, and then you realize it's so much work. So, so don't try to set yourself up for failure. Think about like one or two things that you can take away from this today and make a real change that's maybe small or maybe modest, but will actually make a difference. And then archive it catalog it, keep track of all the resources and all the work that you have put into it so that you can basically bequeath that on to the residents who come behind you. This is a way to grow your conference changes so that over you know, two or three years, you will end up with that dramatic transformation of how your conference is set up. So those are my four take homes. I start by telling you that. And now I'm going to give you a couple of examples, real examples of ways you can use you know, resources to, to make these concepts happen for you. And we'll start off with the first one. Um, how many people in here at your shops are either using EM Foundations or EM Fundamentals? Hands? Some. Okay. So my first concept was flipping your classroom, right? And so you may think, oh, God, that's so much work. I've got to come up with all this, you know, content. It's going to be a small group, and there's all this discussion and case-based stuff. So these are two intern-level uh, curricula that are already ready to go. They're basically a plug and play, super high quality. The first one, um, the EM Fund Fundamentals, was um, created by Eric Chappelle and James Ahn at the University of Chicago. So shout out to them. It's amazing. And what their vision was is they said, for our interns, we want them to be able to handle you know, a handful of common emergencies in the, you know, in the department a handful of like life threats, and then a handful of procedures. We want them to be competent for those you know, situations. And this is modular, it's case-based, it's basically driven um, by content that's already created and ready to go. And so it's, it's fabulous. And the other one, which is from Kristen Moore at Emory, is Foundations of Emergency Medicine. My only quibble is that they couldn't come up with titles that were a little bit different. But anyway, so they're both, they're both level, you know, intern level curricula. But Kristen's foundations is more global. She basically is trying to cover the whole EM curriculum. So it's a little bit more of a big, broad scope. But these are both super high uh, quality. And both Kristen and Eric are very approachable. They love to be contacted. Um, I've talked to both of them. And um, these are things that you could use very easily. What are the challenges of imp incorporating these into your curriculum? Uh, probably the two big ones I see is, one, you need more help from your faculty, because these are all going to be small group, right? So you need extra faculty members every time you're going to do this. But they are all ready to go. So you don't have to ask your faculty to do much, except spend a little bit of time the night before looking over the materials. They can show up and basically you know, be ready to, to uh, run it out. The other thing is you, you need to do something with your non-interns if you're going to use these curricula. But it's, again, relatively easy to come up, I think, with content for that. If you think about what your senior residents are facing at this point, you know, what are all, all your seniors thinking about? Well, you're thinking about you know, job search, life after residency, uh, med mal, billing and coding, um, you know, the boards, getting ready for oral boards. So these are all great things that you could use for content that will be more germane to your senior residents while your interns are off doing you know, these kind of uh, course uh, modules. So there's a couple of ideas for flip classrooms that are already go question. Beautiful. Love it. So yeah, use your other senior residents to help if your faculty is smaller or less willing. And if anyone has other comments or things to add or questions or whatnot throughout this, please uh, feel, feel free to chip in here. So, um, so that's one thing. Um, the second comment I made was the importance of trying to make it interactive, case-based, and small group, right? So for interactivity, sometimes there are going to be times where you have to do like, you know, study guide, question-based 
uh, type of uh, conferences. So when you're doing that, my big tip is please try to use an audience response system, right? So rather than just sitting up here and blowing blah, 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 and asking everyone questions, do something where the audience can get involved. Poll Everywhere is the biggest one on the block, but there's a lot of other ones. There's Mentimeter, we'll mention Kahoot. But basically, these are all ways that you can develop little quizzes. And you know, they're multi multimedia, so you can do like you know, visual diagnosis, you can do multiple choice questions, you can do free text. And the other nice thing is you can get your residents to be um, sort of competing against one, each, one, each one, one another. And that's this always a fun thing if you can make it into a little bit of a competition or a game. So try to use audience response systems. Again, all the, the information about these will be in the handout. Um, I mentioned the fact that we want to try to do case-based lectures whenever possible. So some common popular case-based themes that we came up with when looking into this one was bounce backs. So you know you can have your IT folks pull out like 72 hour bounce back uh, lists of patients and this is a great way to you know talk about cases that maybe you know either weren't handled optimally or just were a huge surprise when the patient came back to your emergency department within 72 hours. It's a wonderful way to get your faculty involved as well because they'll be in the room and I guarantee they're going to have opinions on you know what happened with the case and why the patient came back and, and all the rest of it so that can be a very interactive uh, case um, other case uh, based uh, concepts that are popular are like difficult airway cases that's a popular one to do uh, you know a conference on another one is patients who are admitted to say the floor and then get upgraded to the unit within 24 hours that's another collection of patients who are at high risk and again, if you talk about those patients and what happened with them, there's a lot of educational learning there. There's going to be a lot of opinions from the floor if you bring these cases up. And it's also quality and safety, which is important to uh, your hospital, too. Um, the last thing is that in our shop, whatever we're doing that's like a physical exam based or minimal sort of minimally invasive procedure based, we try to flip that into a lab, right? So this will be a way to do um, small groups, interactive, sort of lay hands on each other and do like, you know, this and for this one, it's um, a dental labs. We break out our dental box. We put the residents into small groups. We have them rotate around and there's a faculty mentor for each group. And then basically each station is a different piece of the dental block, you know, by it's blocks or it's you know using the co-pack or whatever it is and it's a great way to again do hands-on small group instruction so we do that with ortho you know we do that with uh, like the eye lab we do that with the dental lab um, you can really make it very creative and very fun for your residents so the other thing I mentioned as far as making it interactive and fun is the whole idea about turning things into games Online, there are all, a whole bunch of templates that are free or nearly free that mimic you know, the popular TV uh, game shows. So you can do these, and you can basically turn your you know, lecture into something that's, again, a competition, that's fun. You can have prizes, you know, whether or not it's simple things like gift cards or brownies or carrots or whatever you want. But they're basically some way to get folks interacting and, and competing against one another. I mentioned Kahoot. This is again is technically an audience response system, but it's probably the most gamey of the audience response systems. It's got like you know music goes do 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 do, and it has a bunch of you know big colors and things. So it's a lot of fun, and you can again make quizzes having to do with this that are a little bit more interactive and lighthearted than than otherwise. Um, one word about tech. This could be a whole other lecture, but I will mention Desiri as a product. Again, not having any. Uh, ties to any of these products, but to Siri, if you're in um, a Mac world and you have uh, the ability to use like iPads and that kind of system at your shop, you can actually use your iPad with Desiri to control your you know, computer, control your presentation. And by doing that, you can walk around. And so I can take my iPad and I can walk around and my iPad now becomes um, an annotation device. It's a whiteboard. And so I can say, hey, I've got this really cool uh, you know, x-ray. And can you show me on my, my iPad what the interesting finding is on the x-ray? And I'd hand you my, my iPad and you can actually make the mark on it or do the arrow or circle, whatever it is. And then that shows up on the uh, computer screen. So really sophisticated, but also a lot of fun way to get you out of the audience. It completely takes away the whole back row. Oh, I can't see the EKG. I can't tell you what's wrong with it phenomenon because you go to them, you bring them the EKG on your iPad, and then you get to interact with your uh, learners. 
Uh, Google Hangouts, just a, a shout out to that, is a fun technology to get folks from afar to your place. Sometimes you don't have the financial resources to you know, have a big name speaker come in or they don't have the time to travel. But you can bring them in you know, virtually by having them participate in a Google Hangout for your conference. Or even better, if you're doing something like a journal club, invite one of the authors for the, uh, you know, a journal that you're, um, or an article that you're reviewing. Have them come in using Google Hangout and they could actually discuss their own article with your you know, residency while you're discussing in a journal club. All right, so that was flipping your classroom. That was keeping things small group and interactive. And then the third piece of this was, again, reminding you that it's okay to be creative and blow it up once in a while. My, uh, my shout out to this, my, my, my example is, think about escape rooms. Uh, this is something that, from a medical standpoint, I hadn't heard of as of like two years ago. I mean, escape rooms are all over right now. Every single city has full of them. But for medicine, um, people are starting to create medical escape rooms. So, there was actually um, one that was published in the Journal of Education and Teaching. It'll be in your show notes again. It's a tox emergency medicine escape room. And these are the folks from UC Irvine. So uh, Megan Osborne, she's wonderful. And they put everything together for you. So if you go to that article, it shows you what you need, all the different stations, all the different puzzles, what kind of equipment you need to actually create this escape room, and then be able to have your residents go through this. Again, a small group. It's fun. You know, Who doesn't like an escape room? You can put prizes attached to it. And it's a different way to learn that's much, much more interactive than just a lecture on toxicology. Um, and actually, Jennifer Lee from uh, Harbor UCLA gave an uh, innovations um, presentation this morning on the escape room that they had created at, at Harbor. So there's Harbor folks in the room. Again, hats off. It's another, it's a huge amount of work to create one, but at least you can, you can poach the one off of uh, Journal of Education and Technology. And I think Jennifer will be, uh, it sounds like she'll be um, trying to uh, publish hers as well. So I covered the sort of scope of the three big ways you can maybe transform things. The fourth uh, take home again was that concept of keeping it small in the beginning and not trying to do every single thing we're talking about today, but maybe taking one or two of them on and starting small and then archiving. Um, that brings me back to the point that you are going to have to still use PowerPoint. You know, there's no way to get around it. What am I using? I'm using PowerPoint. So um, I think I'm going to give you just uh, as, a, as a last big, big uh, you know, teaching point here, um, my top three PowerPoint fails because you're going to have to use PowerPoint. And it's not that I hate PowerPoint, but I hate bad PowerPoint. And these are the things that I usually see when I'm watching a PowerPoint presentation that make me cringe and make me really unhappy you know, to be in the room. The first one is when presenters try to give too much information. And that's when you see you know, words all over the place on the slide, and there's like you know, graphics, and there's like you know, a whole bunch of nonsensical like animations that don't mean anything, and they don't add anything. And that whole concept of trying to give too much information to the audience and having it be overwhelming is distracting, and it just doesn't work. The second one is visually unappealing slides. Slide design in this day and age is something that everyone should be taking seriously. It's, it's easy, it's fun, and you can actually, again, go to a lecture on it or look stuff up online. There's all sorts of wonderful images and, and basically uh, you know, non-copyrighted uh, you know, um, images sites that you can go to to you know, try to build visually attractive slides. So, so do that, and, and your, your audience will love it, and it'll be a lot more fun for you. And then the last piece that always drives me a little crazy is when the presenters use their slides as a crutch. So they get up there and either they're not well prepared or they're nervous and they you know, turn around and they face the slides and they read everything off and you know, they may as well not even be in the room. You could do the same thing and just read all their slides and then that would be just as effective. So those are my big top three PowerPoint fails. I'm going to put them all together. I'm going to give you um, uh, an example. And uh, you can sort of see what your emotional reaction to the next 20 seconds is and, and here we go. So dual channel theory of information processing and cognitive theory. So in general, people learn better from words and pictures and from words alone. Research shown students learn better from presentations, can graphic narration. Uh, findings known as a redundancy effect. It leads to worse retention. This is because redundancy of text distracts from learning. Oh, the caveat to the redundancy effect, on screen is short, highlights key action, it's placed next to a portion of the graphic describes. It can actually enhance learning. Or, when you give a presentation, there are a couple of concepts that you want to keep in mind. Dual channel theory and cognitive load. Dual channel theory says that we only can process one thing at a time, even though we're taking it in in two channels. We can either 
listen to what the presenta presentation presenter is saying, or we can read what's on the slide. But we actually can't do both. If you try to put too much on a slide and fill it up with words and fill it up with distracting images and a lot of things whizzing around, your audience is going to have cognitive overload. They're going to be distracted, they're going to stop paying attention, and basically you're going to lose them all. So if you're trying to create effective slides and be a good presenter, think about using big, simple, visual images. They should all tie in with what you're trying to say. They should all have something to do with your message. And if you want to choose a few words, and it's actually effective to use a few words, they should reinforce your message. They should be simple and clear. And you really want your audience mostly to be listening to you. You're having a conversation with your audience about a topic, and the primary mode of transmission of information should come from you. So that's the difference. All right. As promised, I've run out of time. So another good thing about doing a presentation well is to know when to stop. Um, so the rest of this is going to be on your handout. This is the piece about how do you take it out of the didactic and into your emergency department. Ah, I, I, this, is, this could go on for a while, so I'm going to skip this. <laughs> just give me the anti-hook, which is nice. I never get that. But this is just basically a moment to think about um, you know, how do you effectively teach in the birth department. There's a couple of my favorite uh, clinical teaching models. One is the one-minute preceptor. The one word I'll say about that is when you're working with medical students, just get a commitment from them. That's the first most important part of the one-minute preceptor, and that is when they're actually presenting to you to make sure that they actually hook into something and they're making a commitment to either a diagnosis or a management plan or whatnot, and then you can explore from there. And there are six steps to the one-minute preceptor. The first three are ways to sort of get at what the learner is thinking. The last three are ways to do feedback, and the feedback is super important when we're talking about clinical learning. Um, the other model that I like is SPIT, super easy, serious, probable, interesting, treatable. It's a great way to just generate differential diagnoses. And I'll say to the student, we're going to SPIT now, and they look at me crazy, but then we go through this. And we think about four different ways, like, you know, pharyngitis. Okay, well, you know, is it going to be, you know, serious? Okay, it's going to be, uh, you know, a peritonsal abscess. Probable, well, it's going to be viral pharyngitis. Um, interesting, well, maybe it's Lemire's. Treatable, it's probably strep. Okay, so, the, you know, this is how you can go through that very quickly and teach your learners to expand their differentials. My two seconds on feedback is try to keep it positive. And the most important thing on feedback is to make sure that you are keeping it case specific and behavior oriented. The worst feedback you're ever going to get, as you all know, because you've all received it, is, oh, that was a really good job. Good shift today. Way to go. See you tomorrow. That helps you not at all, right? So anything you can do to give them behavior um, focused, specific feedback is going to be meaningful. And I'll tell learners, I'm giving you feedback right now. Because I've had residents come up to me and say, you know, you, I just never get any feedback. It's like, I'm giving you feedback all the time. <laughs> you know, but sometimes you have to label it so they actually get it. And we'll take it to heart and we'll take it home with them. So it's OK to say that I'm giving you, you feedback. And anything you have to say that's going to be critical, and they sometimes will need to hear that too, just make sure you take it outside. Um, service versus education is just the uh, comment that you have to do a lot of work in the emergency department, and we get it, and it's hard. And so you have all these learners who are also you know, trying to learn from you. So sometimes it's OK to try to turf them off to other teachers. Remember that they're students in general, so even learning how to do an EKG or put in a Foley or put in an IV, you can use your other educators, your other ancillary staff to teach your learners as well. And you know, a medical student who hasn't you know, done an IV or many IVs before, and you have a nice nurse, you pair them off to go off and do an IV, everybody is going to be happy and you can write a chart, right? So think about how else you can use your learners. If there's anything exciting going on in your department, just send all the students to the code, send them all to the trauma. It's OK if they're all sort of watching and, and hanging out there for a few minutes, if that offloads your work so you can get something else done and make a couple phone calls. Um, again, I want to give a shout out to what's gone on this week at SAM. Some of this, of course, has already happened. You can't go back in time, but you could look on the website and take a look at the handouts. I went to a wonderful uh, pre-day for four hours, actually, on Tuesday. It was tech and medical education. Um, I had some more stuff onto your handout from that. And then uh, on Thursday this morning, again, Jennifer Lee, I mentioned that, the Harbor uh, resident did a Metascape room um, that was really uh, interesting to talk about. 
Um, this afternoon at 4 o'clock, I'll be again listening to Megan at, when she does her games in medical education. And then um, tomorrow morning, if you're interested in good slide design, and it is really fun. If, if you're going to do a lot of lecturing this year, and you probably all will, you might think about checking out. This is 50 minutes on how to do good slides, um, and I highly recommend that as well. So bring it back home. I told you there were four things in the beginning, and you know the idea is you're always going to try to bring it back and reinforce at the end. Try to make sure that your conference is about discussion and not about just information, one-way transmission. So flip your classroom. It's going to be challenging, but hopefully I've given you a few tools and ideas about ways to make that happen. Whenever you can, think in terms of how can I make this more interactive, use audience response systems, think about interesting case-based conference series that you can do, and make it small group whenever you can. It takes a little more work on everyone's part. It's a great way to get your faculty and senior residents again involved in teaching. Get creative once in a while, blow it up. It's fun to really have it be something outside the box. Think about something like an escape room. And again, you can translate some of these escape rooms that have already been created directly into your shop, and you don't have to completely reinvent the wheel. And finally, again, try to not get too um, over-enthusiastic. Make sure you're starting small. Build. Take a few things on at a time, and then keep track of everything you're doing. Stick it all in a Google document or some sort of a folder so that for the people who come after you, you can build and build and build and make it bigger and better every year. I'd be happy to take any questions if we have a minute for that. That's very quiet, very quiet in this room. So I think um, the presentation is smaller and having that, having that sense where you just use less words and more preparation in terms of um, talking points. The problem that I see, and I also envision as I try to implement this at my program, is that that forces residents to prepare. And sometimes they're giving this presentation, you know, after an overnight or they're on trauma and stuff like that. So how do you go about trying to enforce them to be prepared to give these small kind of focused presentations? Yeah, so it's all about expectations and it's all about culture, right? So, you know, you, it, it's the same thing with um, any, like the flip classroom thing. If you send it out, and I, I've had discussions with Eric Chappelle about this with fundamentals, it's, and, and really what it boils down to, if it's, if it's going to be something where it's interactive and it's small group, it's going to be really obvious if the resident hasn't prepared for it. And, and quite honestly, we're all used to wanting to be the best and wanting to do a good job. And there's nothing like showing up to a small group lesson and everyone else has prepared and you haven't, right? So that happens once or twice, and then things change. And then you change the culture of the program and everyone starts stepping up. And hopefully, if you're doing this well, the residents are enjoying that format enough that they realize it's worthwhile to spend the time doing that work ahead of time. And you also have to be careful not to overload your residents. Because of course, if you're saying, oh, read 100 you know, pages of Tintinelli, it's not going to happen. So for these kind of curricula I'm talking about, the intern level curricula, um, it's nice. First of all, they're pretty motivated. They're interns. And then also, they're going to want to do well. And you, and you, again, can just give them enough information that it's actually feasible for them to get through it. As far as the idea about you know, making your slides and all that you know, sort of thought out, Hopefully, again, you know, we're going to do a lecture on giving a good lecture at the beginning of the year. And you try to, again, instill into your residents a sense of you know, why this is worthwhile and why it is going to help everybody learn. And then, um, and then also, of course, whenever possible, like with this, I, you know, I didn't put a lot of words up on the screen, but I have a, I've, it's a seven-page handout. So you're going to get that all, and you can you know, look at it or not. But there's a bunch of like, references and things in there. So you could do the same thing if you're putting together a lecture and you're trying to transmit some information. Let your audience you know, sit back and relax a little bit, but promise them that the information will be there for them in a the form of a handout. So there's sort of two different things. If you want to be small group about it and flip classroom, you're just going to change the expectations of your program you know, when the residents show up once or twice and not being prepared. And when it comes to these big group kind of things, just make sure that the information you want to get across, if it's not something that you don't want people to take notes from, give them a handout afterwards. Any other uh, questions or feedback? All right, well, thank you very much. Have a wonderful year. Good luck, everybody.